to Google I.O. I love you guys too. Can't believe it's one year already. Uh, it's a beautiful day. We're being joined by over 7,000 people and we are live streaming this as always to over 400 events in 85 countries. Uh, last year was the 10th year since Google I.O. started and so we moved it closer to home at Shoreline back where it all began. Uh, seems to have gone well. I checked the Wikipedia entry from last year. There were some mentions of sunburn so we have plenty of sunscreen all around. It's on us. Use it liberally. Uh, it's been a very busy year since last year. No different from my 13 years at Google. That's because we've been focused ever more on our core mission of organizing the world's information, and we are doing it for everyone, and we approach it by applying deep computer science and technical insights to solve problems at scale. That approach has served us very, very well. This is what has allowed us to scale up seven of our most important products and platforms to over a billion monthly active users each. And it's not, the, not just the scale at which these products are working. Users engage with them very heavily. YouTube not just has over a billion users, but every single day, users watch over one billion hours of videos on YouTube. Google Maps. Every single day, users navigate over one billion kilometers with Google Maps. So the scale is inspiring to see, and there are other products approaching the scale. We launched Google Drive five years ago, and today it is over 800 million monthly active users, and every single week there are over three billion objects uploaded to Google Drive. Two years ago, at Google I.O., we launched Photos as a way to organize users' photos using machine learning. And today, we are over 500 million active users, and every single day, users upload 1.2 billion photos to Google. So the scale of these products are amazing, but they're all still working up their way towards Android, which I'm excited as of this week, we crossed over 2 billion active devices of Android. As you can see, the, the robot is pretty happy to behind me. So it's a privilege to serve users at this scale. And this is all because of the growth of mobile and smartphones. But computing is evolving again. We spoke last year about this important shift in computing from a mobile first to an AI first approach. Mobile made us reimagine every product we were working on. We had to take into account that the user interaction model had fundamentally changed with multi-touch, location, identity, payments, and so on. Similarly, in the AI-first world, we are rethinking all our products and applying machine learning and AI to solve user problems. And we are doing this across every one of our products. So today, if you use Google Search, we rank differently using machine learning. Or if you're using Google Maps, Street View automatically recognizes restaurant signs, street signs, using machine learning. Duo with video calling uses machine learning for low bandwidth situations. And Smart Reply in Allo last year had great reception. And so today, we are excited that we are rolling out Smart Reply to over 1 billion users of Gmail. It works really well. Here's a sample email. If you get an email like this, the machine learning systems learn to be conversational, and it can reply, I'm fine with Saturday or whatever. So it's really nice to see. Just like with every platform shift, how users interact with computing changes. Mobile brought multi-touch. We evolved beyond keyboard and mouse. Similarly, we now have voice and vision as new, two new important modalities for computing. Humans are interacting with computing in more natural and immersive ways. Let's start with voice. We've been using voice as an input across many of our products. That's because computers are getting much better at understanding speech. We've had significant breakthroughs, but the pace and even since last year has been pretty amazing to see. A 
our word error rate continues to improve even in very noisy environments. This is why if you speak to Google on your phone or Google Home, we can pick up your voice accurately even in noisy environments. When we were shipping Google Home, we had originally planned to include eight microphones so that we could accurately locate the source of where the, where the user was speaking from. But thanks to deep learning, we used a technique called neural beam forming, we were able to ship it with just two microphones and achieve the same quality. Deep learning is what allowed us about two weeks ago to announce support for multiple users in Google Home so that we can recognize up to six people in your house and personalize the experience for each and every one. So voice is becoming an important modality in our products. The same thing is happening with vision. Similar to speech, we are seeing great improvements in computer vision. So when we look at a picture like this, we are able to understand the attributes behind the picture. We realize it's your boy in a birthday party there was cake and family involved and your boy was happy. So we can understand all that better now. And our computer vision systems now for the task of image recognition are even better than humans. So it's astounding progress and we're using it across our products. So if you use the Google Pixel, it has the best in class camera and we do a, do a lot of work with computer vision. You can take a low light picture like this, which is noisy, and we automatically make it much clearer for you. Or, or, coming, or coming very soon, if you take a picture of your daughter at a baseball game, and there is something obstructing it, we can do the hard work, remove the obstruction, and have the picture of what matters to you in front of you. We are clearly at an inflection point with vision, and so today we are announcing a new initiative called Google Lens. Google Lens is a set of vision-based computing capabilities that can understand what you're looking at and help you take action based on that information. We'll ship it first in Google Assistant and Photos, and it'll come to other products. So how does it work? So for example, if you run into something and you want to know what it is, say a flower, you can invoke Google Lens from your assistant, point your phone at it, and we can tell you what flower it is. It's great for someone like me with allergies. <laughs> or if you've ever been at a friend's place and you've crawled under a desk just to get the username and password from a Wi-Fi router, you can point your phone at it. we can automatically do the hard work for you. Or if you're walking in a street downtown and you see a set of restaurants across you, you can point your phone because we know where you are and we have our knowledge graph and we know what you're looking at, we can give you the right information in a meaningful way. As you can see, we are beginning to understand images and videos. All of Google was built because we started understanding text and web pages. So the fact that computers can understand images and videos has profound implications for our core mission. When we started working on search, we wanted to do it at scale. This is why we rethought our uh, computational architecture. We designed our data centers from the ground up, and we put a lot of effort in them. Now that we are evolving uh, for this machine learning and AI world, we are rethinking our computational architecture again. We are building what we think of as AI-first data centers. This is why last year we launched the tensor processing units. They are custom hardware for machine learning. They were about 15 to 30 times faster or 30 to 80 times more power efficient than CPUs and GPUs at that time. We use TPUs across all our products. Every time you do a search, every time you speak to Google, in fact, TPUs are what powered AlphaGo in its historic match against LaserDoll. As you know, machine learning has two components. Training, that is how we build a neural net. We, we, you know, training is very computationally intensive. 
and inferences what we do at real time so that when you show it a picture, we recognize whether it's a dog or a cat and so on. Last year's TPU software optimized for inference. Training is computationally very intensive. To give you a sense, each one of our machine translation models takes a training of uh, over three billion words for a week on about 100 GPUs. So we've been working hard, and I'm really excited to announce our next generation of TPUs, cloud TPUs, which are optimized for both training and inference. What you see behind me is one cloud TPU board. It has four chips in it, and each board is capable of 180 trillion floating point operations per second. And you know, we have designed it for our data center so you can easily stack them. You can put 64 of these into one big supercomputer. We call these TPU pods, and each pod is capable of 11.5 petaflops. It is an important advance in technical infrastructure for the AI era. The reason we named it, named it Cloud TPU is because we are bringing it through the Google Cloud Platform. So Cloud TPUs are coming to Google Compute Engine as of today. We want Google Cloud to be the best cloud for machine learning. And so we want to provide our customers with a wide range of hardware, be it CPUs, GPUs, uh, including the great GPUs NVIDIA announced last week, and now cloud TPUs. So this lays the foundation for significant progress. So we are focused on driving the shift and applying AI to solving problems. At Google, we are bringing our AI efforts together under Google.ai. It's a collection of efforts and teams across the company focused on bringing the benefits of AI to everyone. Google.ai will focus on three areas. State-of-the-art research, tools and infrastructure, like TensorFlow and Cloud TPUs, and applied AI. So let me talk a little bit about these areas. Talking about research, we are excited about designing better machine learning models, but today it is really time consuming. It's a painstaking effort of a few engineers and scientists, mainly machine learning PhDs. We want it to be possible for hundreds of thousands of developers to use machine learning. So what better way to do this than getting neural nets to design better neural nets? We call this approach AutoML. It's learning to learn. So the way it works is we take a set of candidate neural nets, think of these as little baby neural nets, and we actually use a neural net to iterate through them till we arrive at the best neural net. We use a reinforcement learning approach. And it's, the, the results are promising. To do this is computationally hard, but cloud TPUs put it in the realm of possibility. We are already approaching state of the art in standard tasks like CIFAR image recognition. So whenever I spend time with a team and think about neural nets building their own neural nets, it reminds me of one of my favorite movies, Inception. And I tell them, we must go deeper. <laughs> so we are taking all these AI advances and applying them to newer, harder problems across a wide range of disciplines. One such area is healthcare. Last year, I spoke about our work on diabetic retinopathy. It's a preventable cause of blindness. This year, we published our paper in the Journal of American Medical Association, and Verily is working on bringing products to the medical community. Another such area is pathology. Pathology is a very complex area. If you take an area like breast cancer diagnosis, even amongst highly trained pathologists, agreement on some forms of breast cancer can be as low as 48%. That's because there, each pathologist is reviewing the equivalent of 1,000 10 megapixel images for every case. This is a large data problem, but one which machine learning is uniquely equipped to solve. So we built neural nets to detect cancer spreading to adjacent lymph nodes. It's early days, but our neural nets show a much higher degree of accuracy, 89% compared to previous methods of 73%. There are important caveats. We do have higher false positives, but 
already giving this in the hands of pathologists, they can improve diagnosis. In general, I think this is a great approach for machine learning, providing tools for people to do what they do better. And we are applying it across even basic sciences. Take biology. We are training neural nets to improve the accuracy of DNA sequencing. Deep variant is a new tool from Google.ai that identifies genetic variants more accurately than state-of-the-art methods. Reducing errors is important applications. We can more accurately identify whether or not a patient has genetic disease and can help with better diagnosis and treatment. We are applying it to chemistry. We are using machine learning to predict the properties of molecules. Today, it takes an incredible amount of computing resources to hunt for new molecules, and we think we can accelerate timelines by orders of magnitude. This opens up possibilities in drug discovery or material sciences. I'm entirely confident one day AI will invent new molecules with, that behave in predefined ways. Not everything we are doing is so profound. You know, we are doing even simple and fun things, like a simple tool which can help people draw. We call this auto draw. Just like today when you type in Google, we give you suggestions, we can do the same when you're trying to draw. Even I can draw with this thing. So it may look like fun and games, but pushing computers to do things like this is what helps them be creative and actually gain knowledge. So we are very excited about progress even in these areas as well. So we're making impressive progress in applied machine learning and we are applying it across all our products. But the most important product we are using this is for Google Search and Google Assistant. We are evolving Google Search to being more assistive for our users. This is why last year at Google I.O. we spoke about the Assistant and since then, we've launched it on Google Pixel and Google Home. Scott and team are gonna talk more about it. But before that, let's take a look at the many amazing ways people have been using the Google Assistant. Okay, Google. Hey, Google. Hey, Google. Okay, Google. Hey, Google. Play some dance music. Sure. My guest will be Kimmy Schmidt on Netflix. Okay, Google, count to 100. Sure. One, two, three. Play vacuum harmonica on my TV. 71, 72, 73. Play the Wonder Woman trailer. Hey, Google, talk to Dominus. Talk to Lonely Planet. Talk to Cora. Show me my folders from last weekend. <laughs> Your car is parked at 22B. Today in the news. Turn the lower room lights on. Okay, turning on the lights. I'm back, baby. Hey, Google, drop a B. Flip a coin. Call Jill. Set a timer. Talk to Headspace. And then just for a moment, I'd like you to let go of any focus at all. Just let your mind do whatever it wants to do. Done. Done. Hey, Google, good night. Turn, Turn on all the things. See you tomorrow. Hey everyone, last year at I.O. we introduced the Google Assistant, a way for you to have a conversation with Google to get things done in your world. Today, as Sundar mentioned, we're well on our way with the Assistant available on over 100 million devices. But just as Google Search simplified the web and made it more useful for everyone, your Google Assistant simplifies all the technology in your life. You should be able to just express what you want throughout your day and the right thing should happen. That's what the Google Assistant is all about. It's your own individual Google. But that video we saw really captures the momentum of this project. We've made such big strides, and there's so much more to talk about today. The Assistant is becoming even more conversational, always available wherever you need it, and ready to help get even more things done. First, we fundamentally believe that the Google Assistant should be hands down the easiest way to accomplish tasks and that's through conversation. It comes so naturally to humans, and now Google is getting really good at conversation too. 
Almost 70% of requests to the assistant are expressed in natural language, not the typical keywords that people type in a search box. And many requests are follow-ups that continue the conversation. We're really starting to crack the hard computer science challenge of conversationality by combining our strengths in speech recognition, natural language understanding, and contextual meaning. Now recently we made the assistant even more conversational, so each member of the family gets relevant responses just for them by asking with their own voice. And we're continuing to make interacting with your assistant more natural. For example, it doesn't always feel comfortable to speak out loud to your assistant. So today, we're adding the ability to type to your assistant on the phone. Now this is great when you're in a public place and you don't want to be overheard. The assistant's also learning conversation beyond just words. With another person, it's really natural to talk about what you're looking at. Sundar spoke earlier about how AI and deep learning have led to tremendous strides in computer vision. Soon, with the smarts of Google Lens, your assistant will be able to have a conversation about what you see. Now, this is really cool, and Ibrahim is here to help me show you a couple examples of what we'll launch in the coming months. So, last time I traveled to Osaka, I came across a line of people waiting to try something that smelled amazing. Now, I don't speak Japanese, so I couldn't read the sign out front. But Google Translate knows over a hundred languages, and my assistant will help with visual translation. I just tap the Google Lens icon, point the camera, and my assistant can instantly translate the menu to English. And now I can continue the conversation. What does it look like? These pictures should match. All right, it looks pretty yummy. Now notice, I never had to type the name of the dish. My assistant used visual context and answered my question conversationally. Let's look at another example. Some of the most tedious things I do on my phone stem from what I see. A business card I want to save, details from a receipt I need to track, and so on. With Google Lens, my assistant will be able to help with those kinds of tasks too. I love live music and sometimes I see info for shows around town that look like fun. Now. I can just tap the Google Lens icon and point the camera at the venue's marquee. My assistant instantly recognizes what I'm looking at. Now, if I wanted to, I could tap to hear some of this band's songs, and my assistant offers other helpful suggestions right in the viewfinder. There's one to buy tickets from Ticketmaster and another to add the show to my calendar. With just a tap, my assistant adds the concert details to my schedule. Saving event. Save Stone Foxes for May 17th at 9 p.m. Awesome. My assistant helped me keep track of the event, so I won't miss the show, and I didn't have to open a bunch of apps or type anything. Thanks, Ibrahim. So that's how the assistant is getting better at conversation, by understanding language and voices, with new input choices, and with the power of Google Lens. Second, the assistant is becoming a more connected experience that's available everywhere you need help. From your living room to your morning jog, from your commute to errands around town, your assistant should know how to use all of your connected devices for your benefit. Now we're making good progress in bringing the assistant to those two billion phones and other devices powered by Android, like TVs, wearables, and car systems. And today, I'm excited to announce that the Google Assistant is now available on the iPhone. So no matter what smartphone you use, you can now get help from the same smart assistant throughout the day, at home and on the go. The assistant brings together all your favorite Google features on the iPhone. Just ask to get package delivery details from Gmail, watch videos from your favorite YouTube creators, get answers from Google Search, and much more. You can even turn on the lights and heat up the house before you get home. Now, Android devices and iPhones are just part of the story. We think the assistant should be available on all kinds of devices where people might want to ask for help. The new Google Assistant SDK allows any device manufacturer to easily build the Google Assistant into whatever they're building. Speakers, toys, drink mixing robots, whatever crazy device all of you think of, now can incorporate the Google Assistant. Now, we're working with many of the world's best consumer brands and their suppliers, so keep an eye out for the badge that says Google Assistant built in when you do your holiday shopping this year. Now, obviously, another aspect 
of being useful to people everywhere is support for many languages. I'm excited to announce that starting this summer, the Google Assistant will begin rolling out in French, German, Brazilian, Portuguese, and Japanese on both Android phones and iPhones. By the end of the year, we'll also support Italian, Spanish, and Korean. So that's how the Assistant is becoming more conversational and how it will be available in even more contexts. Finally, the Assistant needs to be able to get all kinds of useful things done for people. You know, people sometimes ask if the Assistant is just a new way to search. Now, of course, you can ask your Assistant to get all sorts of answers from Google Search. But beyond finding information, users are also asking the Assistant to do all sorts of things for them. Now, as you've already seen, the Assistant can tap into capabilities across many Google apps and services. But Google's features are just part of the story. We also opened the Assistant to third-party developers who are building some really useful integrations. I'll turn it over to Valerie to share more about how the developer platform is getting stronger. Hi. OK, so for the actions on Google platform, it's been awesome to see how developers like you have been engaging with the Google Assistant. Honestly, you have built some really cool integrations. Like I can ask Food Network about the recipe that's on TV right now. I can work out with Fitstar, uh, ask CNBC about the news. Or my husband and I can play Name That Tune with Song Pop, which he is surprisingly good at. Until now, these experiences have been available through the Assistant on Google Home. But today, we're also bringing them to Android phones and iPhones. It's over 100 million devices on Android alone. So now people can get to Google features and third-party services from anywhere. And they can even pick up where they left off across devices. So not only are third-party integrations available in more places, they'll be able to do more. Starting today, Actions on Google will be supporting transactions. It's a complete end-to-end -end solution for developers, including payments, identity, notifications, receipts, even account creation. The platform handles all the complexity. Let me show you how it will work. Hi, how can I help? I'd like delivery from Panera. Hi, this is Panera. I'll need your delivery address. Which one can I get from Google? We'll go with 1600 Amphitheater. What can I get you started with? Uh, the strawberry poppy seed salad with steak instead of chicken. Got it. How about one of these cold drinks? And here I can just swipe through my options, see what looks good. I got a lemonade. Great. Are you ready to check out? Yep. Okay. The total is $18.40. Are you ready to place the order? Yes. I'll just scan my fingerprint to pay with Google. And that's it. Thanks. You're all set. Yeah. Super easy, like I was talking to someone at the store. So here I was a new Panera customer. I didn't have to install anything or create an account. You've also probably noticed I didn't have to enter my address or my credit card. I just saved those earlier with Google, and Panera used built-in platform calls to request the information. And I was in control over what I shared every step of the way. So, <laughs> the developer platform is also getting much stronger for home automation integrations. Actions on Google can now support any smart home developer that wants to add conversational control. Today, over 70 smart home companies work with the Google Assistant. So now on my Google Home or from my phone, I can lock my front door with August locks, control a range of LG appliances, or check in on my son's room by putting the Nest Cam on TV. All right. Now that we're talking about making your home smarter, we also have a lot of news to share today about Google Home, our own smart speaker with the Google Assistant built in. Here to tell you more is Rishi Chandra. Thanks, Valerie. You know, it's really hard to believe. We launched Google Home a little over six months ago, and we've been really busy ever since. Since launch, we've added 50 new features, including some of my favorites, like support for Google Shopping, where I can use my voice to order items from Costco right to my front door. 
Or I can get step-by-step -step cooking instructions from over five million recipes. Or I can even play my favorite song just by using the lyrics. Now in April, we launched in the UK to some great reviews. And starting this summer, we're gonna be launching in Canada, Australia, France, Germany, and Japan. And with support from multiple users, we can unlock the full potential of Google Home to offer a truly personal experience. So now, you can schedule a meeting, set a reminder, or get your own daily briefing with My Day by using your own voice, and get your commute, your calendar appointments, and your news sources. Now today, I'd like to short share four new features we'll be rolling out over the coming months. So first, we're announcing support for proactive assistance coming to Google Home. Home is great at providing personally relevant information for you when you ask for it, but we think it'd be even more helpful if it can automatically notify you of those timely and important messages. And we do this by understanding the context of your daily life and proactively looking for that really helpful information and providing it for you in a hands-free way. So for example, let's say I'm relaxing and playing a game with the kids. Well, I can see that the Google Home lights just turned on. Hey, Google, what's up? Hi, Rishi. Traffic's heavy right now, so you'll need to leave in 14 minutes to get to Shoreline Athletic Fields by 3.30 p.m. That's pretty nice. The assistant saw the game coming up on my calendar and got my attention because I had to leave earlier than normal. So now my daughter can make it to that soccer game right on time. Now we're going to start simple with really important messages like reminders, traffic delays, and flight status changes. And with multiple user support, you have the ability to control the type of proactive notifications you want over time. All right, second, another really common activity we do in the home today is communicate with others. And a phone call is still the easiest way to reach someone. So today, I'm excited to announce hands-free calling coming to Google Home. <clears throat> it's really simple to use. Just ask the Google Assistant to make a call, and we'll connect you. You can call any landline or mobile number in the US or Canada completely free. And it's all done in a hands-free way. For example, let's say I forgot to call my mom on Mother's Day. Well, now I can call her while I'm scrambling to get the kids ready for school in the morning. I just need to say, hey, Google, call mom. Sure, calling mom. So you're finally calling. Mother's Day was three days ago. Yeah. Sorry about that. They made me rehearse for I.O. on Mother's Day. Speaking of which, you're on stage right now. Say hi to everyone. Oh, hi, everyone. So hopefully this makes up for not calling, right? No, it doesn't. You still need to visit and bring flowers. Okay, I'm on it. Bye. Bye. It's that simple. We're just making a standard phone call through Google Home. So my mom didn't need to learn anything new. She just needed to answer her phone. There's no additional setup apps, or even phone required. And since the assistant recognized my voice, we called my mom. If my wife had asked, we would have called her mom. We can personalize calling just like everything else. And now anyone in the home can call friends, family, even businesses. Maybe even a local florist to get some flowers for your mom. Now by default, we're going to call out with a private number. But you also have the option to link your mobile number to the Google Assistant. And we'll use that number whenever we recognize your voice. So whoever you call, what's know it's coming from you. Now we're rolling out hands-free calling the US to all existing Google Home devices over the next few months. It's the ultimate hands-free speakerphone. No setup required, call anyone, including personal contacts or businesses, and even dial out with their personal number when we detect your voice. We can't wait for you to try it out. OK, third, let's talk a little bit about entertainment. We designed Google Home to be a great speaker, one that you can put in any room in the house or wirelessly connect to other Chromecast built-in speaker systems. Well, today we're announcing that Spotify, in addition to their subscription service, will be adding their free music service to Google Home. So it's even easier to play your Spotify playlist. We'll also be adding support for SoundCloud and Deezer, two of the largest global music services today. And these music services will join many of the others already available through the Assistant. And finally, we'll be adding Bluetooth support to all existing Google Home devices, so you can play any audio from your iOS or Android device. But Google Home can do much more than just audio. Last year, we launched the ability to use your voice 
to play YouTube, Netflix, and Google Photos right on your TV. And today we're announcing additional partners, including HBO Now. So just say what you want to watch, and we'll play it for you all in a hands-free way. With Google Home, we want to make it really easy to play your favorite entertainment. Okay, finally, I want to talk a little bit about how we see the assistant evolving to help you in a more visual way. Voice responses are great, but sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words. So today, we're announcing support for visual responses with Google Home. Now to do that, we need a screen. Well, fortunately, many of us already have a ton of screens in our home today. Our phones, our tablets, even our TVs. The Google Assistant should smartly take advantage of all these different devices to provide you the best response on the right device. For example, with Google Home, I can easily get location information. OK, Google, where's my next event? Your Pokemon Go hike is at Rancho San Antonio Reserve. It's for it's my at kids. It's for my today. kids. Relax. <laughs> But if I want to view the directions, the best place to do it is on my phone. Well, soon you can just say, OK, Google, let's go. All right, I'm sending the best route to your phone. It will automatically your phone, notify your phone, whether it's Android or iOS, and take you straight to Google Maps. So you can glance at directions, interact with the map, or just start navigation. It's really simple. Now, TVs are another natural place to get help from the Google Assistant. And we have a great place to start with over 50 million Chromecast and Chromecast built-in devices. So today, we're announcing that we'll be updating Chromecast to show visual responses on your TV when you ask for help for Google Home. For example, I can now say, OK, Google, show my calendar for Saturday. Showing it on your TV. It'll show up right on the TV screen. I'll immediately get results from the assistant. And since the assistant detected my voice, we're showing my calendar. Others will see their calendar by using their, their voice. We can personalize the experience even on the TV. They can continue to follow up the conversation. Uh, looks like I have a biking trip to Santa Cruz. Uh, what's the weather in Santa Cruz this weekend? This weekend in Santa Cruz, it will be clear and sunny most of the time. So it's really easy and it's all hands free. Your assistant can provide a visual response to a TV to a lot of different types of questions. You know, we talked how easy it is to play what you want to watch on the TV screen. But what about those times you don't know what to watch? Well, soon you could just ask, hey, Google, what's on YouTube? Here you go. And it'll show me my personalized results right on the TV screen. If I don't like any of the options, I can continue the conversation with my voice. Uh, show my watch later list. All right. Play Send My Love. Play Send My Love from YouTube. It's really simple. Again, no remotes or phone required. In a short conversation, I found something really interesting to watch using Google Home. I can even do it with other things. OK, Google, what's on my DVR? Here you go. Here we're showing how it works with YouTube TV, a new live TV streaming service that gives you live sports and shows from popular TV networks. And YouTube TV includes a cloud DVR, so I can easily play my saved episodes. Everything can be done in a hands-free way, all from the comfort of my couch. And over time, we're going to bring all those developer actions that Valerie already talked about right to the TV screen. So we do even more over time with Google Home. And that's our update for Google Home. Proactive assistance to bring important information to you at the right time. Simple and easy hands-free calling. More entertainment options, and evolving the assistant to provide visual responses in the home. Next up is Anil, who's going to talk about Google Photos. <laughs> we launched Google Photos with an audacious goal, to be the home for all your photos, automatically organized and brought to life so that you could easily share and save what matters. In doing so, we took a fundamentally different approach. We built a product from the ground up with AI at its core. And that's enabled us to do things in ways that only Google can. Like when you're looking for that one photo you can't find, Google Photos organizes your library by people, places, and things. Simply type a nail pineapple Hawaii and instantly find this gem. Or when you come home from vacation overwhelmed by the hundreds of photos you took, Google Photos will give you an album curated with only the best shots, removing duplicates and blurry images. This is the secret ingredient 
behind Google Photos. And the momentum we've seen in these two short years is remarkable. As Sundar mentioned, we now have more than half a billion monthly active users, uploading more than 1.2 billion photos and videos per day. And today, I'm excited to show you three new features we're launching to make it even easier to send and receive the meaningful moments in your life. Now, at first glance, it might seem like photo sharing is a solved problem. After all, there's no shortage of apps out there that are great at keeping you and your friends and family connected. But we think there's still a big and different problem that needs to be addressed. Let me show you what I mean. If there's one thing you know, it's that you're a great photographer. If there's a second thing you know, it's that you're kind of a terrible person. What? Yeah, you heard me. The only photo of the birthday girl in focus? Never sent it. The best picture of the entire wedding? Kept it to yourself. This masterpiece of your best friend? We were gonna send it, but then you were like, oh, remember that sandwich? I love that sandwich. If only something could say, hey, Eric looks great in these, do you wanna send them to him? And you could be like, great idea. Well, it can. Wait, it can? Yep, with Google Photos. So today, to make us all a little less terrible people, we're announcing suggested sharing. Because we've all been there, right? Like when you're taking that group photo and you insist that it be taken with your camera, because you know if it's not on your camera, you are never seeing that photo ever again. Now, thanks to the machine learning in Google Photos, we'll not only remind you so you don't forget to share, we'll even suggest the photos and people you should share with. In one tap, you're done. Let's have a look at suggested sharing in action. I'm once again joined on stage by my friend and Google Photos product lead, David Lieb. All right, so here are a bunch of photos Dave took while bowling with the team last weekend. He was too busy enjoying the moment, so he never got around to sharing them. But this time, Google Photos sent him a reminder via notification and also by badging the new sharing tab. The sharing tab is where you're gonna be able to find all of your Google Photos sharing activity. And at the top, your personal suggestions based on your sharing habits and what's most important to you. Here is the sharing suggestion that Dave got from his day bowling. Google Photos recognized this was a meaningful moment. It selected the right shots and it figured out who he should send it to based on who was in the photos. In this case, it's John V, Jason, and a few others who are also at the event. Dave can now review the photos selected, as well as update the recipients, or if he's happy with it, he can just tap send. And that's it. Google Photos will even send an SMS or an email to anyone who doesn't have the app, and that way everyone can view and save the full resolution photos, even if they don't have Google Photos accounts. And because Google Photo sharing works on any device, including iOS, let's have a look at what John V sees on her iPhone. She receives a notification, and tapping on it lets her quickly jump right into the album and look at all the photos that Dave has shared with her. But notice here at the bottom, she's asked to contribute the photos she took from the event, with Google Photos automatically identifying and suggesting the right ones. John V can review the suggestions and then simply tap Add. Now all of these photos are finally pooled together in one place, and Dave gets some photos he's actually in which is great because a home for all your photos really should include photos of you. Now, even though suggested sharing takes the work out of sharing, sometimes there's a special person in your life who you share just about everything with. Your partner, your best friend, your sibling. Wouldn't it be great if Google Photos automatically shared photos with that person? For example, I would love it if every photo I ever took of my kids was automatically shared with my wife. And that's why today we're also announcing shared libraries. Let me show you how it works. So here, we're now looking at my Google Photos account. From the menu, I now have the option to go ahead and share my library, which I'm gonna go ahead and do with my wife, Jess. Importantly, I have complete control over which photos I automatically share. I can share them all, 
or I can share a subset, like only photos of the kids, or only photos from a certain date forward, like when we first met. In this case, I'm gonna go ahead and share all. <laughs> we did not meet today. And that's all there is to it. I've now gone ahead and shared my library with my wife, Jess. So let's switch to her phone to see what the experience looks like from her end. She receives a notification, and after accepting, she can now go to see all the photos that I've shared with her, which she can access really easily from the menu. If she sees something she likes, she can go ahead and select those photos and simply save them to her library. We'll even notify her periodically as I take new photos. Now, this is great, but what if Jess doesn't want to have to keep coming back to this view and checking if I shared new photos for her, with her? She just wants every photo I take of her or the kids to automatically be saved to her library, just as if she took the photos herself. With shared libraries, she can do just that, choosing to auto-save photos of specific people. Now, anytime I take photos of her or the kids, without either of us having to do anything, they'll automatically appear in the main view of her app. Let me show you. Now, I couldn't justify pulling the kids out of school today just to have their photo taken, but I do have the next best thing. All right. Let me introduce you to Ava and Lily. All righty here. So I'm gonna go ahead, take a photo with the girls. Smile, kids! Ah, fantastic. And since this is too good of an opportunity, I'm gonna have to take one with all of you here too, all right? There we go, woo! Brilliant, all right. Okay, so thank you girls, much appreciated. Back to school we go. All right, so using nothing more than the standard camera app on my phone, I've gone ahead and taken one photo with my kids and one photo with all of you here in the audience. Google Photos is gonna back these two photos up, it's gonna share them with Jess, and then it's gonna recognize the photo that has my kids in them and automatically save just that one to her library like you can see right here. Now finally, Jess and I can stop worrying about whose phone we're using to take the photos. All the photos of our family are in my Google Photos app and they automatically appear in hers too. And best of all, these family photos are part of both of our search results and they're included in the great collages, movies, and other fun creations that Google Photos makes for us. But notice how only the photos with the kids showed up in Jess's main view. But because I shared my entire library with her, I can simply go to the menu, and Jess can now see all of the photos, including the one with all of you. And that's how easy sharing can be in Google Photos. Spend less time worrying about sharing your memories and more time actually enjoying them. Suggested sharing and shared libraries will be rolling out on Android, iOS, and web in the coming weeks. Finally, we know sharing doesn't always happen through apps and screens. There's still something pretty special about looking at and even gathering around an actual printed photo. But printing photos and albums today is hard. You have to hunt across devices and accounts to find the right photos, select the best among the duplicates and blurry images, upload them to a printing service, and then arrange them across dozens of pages. It can take hours of sitting in front of a computer just to do one thing. Thankfully, our machine learning in Google Photos already does most of this work for you, and today we're bringing it all together with the launch of PhotoBooks. They're beautiful, high quality, with a clean and modern design, but the best part is that they're incredibly easy to make, even on your phone. What used to take hours now only takes minutes. I recently made a book for Jess on Mother's Day, and let me show you just how easy and fast that was. First, thanks to unlimited storage, all my life's moments are already here in Google Photos. No need to upload them to another website or app. So I'll select a bunch of photos here, and the good news is, 
I don't have to figure out which are the right photos and which are the good ones, because this is where Google Photos really shines. I'm just going to go ahead and hit plus, select photo book. I'm going to pick a hardcover book. We offer both a soft cover and a hard cover. And notice what happens. Google Photos is going to pick the best photos for me automatically, automatically suggesting photo, 40 in this case. How awesome is that? And it's even going to go ahead and lay them all out for me. All that's left for me to do is make a couple of tweaks, check out, and in a few days, I'll end up with one of these beautiful printed photo books. And soon, we'll make it even easier to get started, applying machine learning to create personalized photo books you'll love. So when you go to photo books from the menu, you'll see pre-made books tailored just for you. Your trip to the Grand Canyon, time with your family during the holidays, or your pet, or even your kid's artwork, all easily customizable. We'll even notify you when there are new photo book suggestions. Photo books are available today in the US on photos.google.com, and they'll be rolling out on Android and iOS next week, and we'll be expanding to more countries soon. I am really excited about this launch, and I want all of you to be the first to try it out. And that's why everyone here at I.O. will be receiving a free hardcover photo book. It's a great example of machine learning at work. So those are the three big updates related to sharing in Google Photos. Suggested sharing, shared libraries, and photo books. Three new features built from the ground up with AI at their core. I can't wait for all of you to try them out real soon. Now before I go, I want to touch on what Sundar mentioned earlier, which is the way we're taking photos is changing. Instead of the occasional photo with friends and family, we now take 30 identical photos of a sunset. We're also taking different types of photos, not just photos to capture a personal memory, but as a way to get things done. Whiteboards we want to remember, receipts we need to file, books we'd like to read. And that's where Google Lens and its vision-based computing capabilities comes in. It can understand what's in an image and help you get things done. Scott showed how Google Lens in the Assistant can identify what you're looking at and help you on the fly. But what about after you've taken the photo? There are lots of photos you want to keep and then look back on later to learn more and take action. And for that, we're bringing Google Lens right into Google Photos. Let me show you. So let's say you took a trip to Chicago. There's some beautiful architecture there. And during your boat tour down the Chicago River, you took lots of photos. But it's hard to remember which building is which later on. Now, by activating Lens, you can identify some of the cool buildings in your photos, like the second tallest skyscraper in the US, Willis Tower. You can even pull up directions and get the hours for the viewing deck. And later, while visiting the Art Institute, you might take photos of a few paintings you really love. In one tap, you can learn more about the painting and the artist. And the screenshot that your friend sent you of that bike rental place, just activate Lens, and you can tap the phone number and make the call right from the photo. Lens will be rolling out in Google Photos later this year and will be continually improving the experience so it recognizes even more objects and lets you do even more with them. And those are the updates for Google Photos. Now let's see what's next from YouTube. Good morning, everyone. I am thrilled to be here at my first ever I.O. on behalf of YouTube. Thank you. So that opening video that we all just saw, that's a perfect glimpse into what makes YouTube so special, the incredible diversity of content. A billion people around the globe come to YouTube every month to watch videos from new and unique voices.
and we're hard at work to make sure that we can reach the next billion viewers, which you'll hear about in a later I.O. session today. We want to give everyone the opportunity to watch the content on YouTube. So YouTube is different from traditional media in a number of ways. First of all, YouTube is open. Anyone in the world can upload a video that everyone can watch. You can be a vlogger broadcasting from your bedroom, a gamer live streaming from your console, or a citizen journalist documenting events live from your phone on the front lines. And what we've seen is that openness leads to important conversations that help shape society. From advancing LGBTQ rights, to highlighting the plight of refugees, to encouraging body positivity. And we've seen in our numbers that users really want to engage with this type of diverse content. We are proud that last year, we passed a billion hours a day being watched on YouTube and our viewership is not slowing down. The second way that YouTube is different from traditional media is that it's not a one-way broadcast. It's a two-way conversation. Viewers interact directly with their favorite creators via comments, mobile live streaming, fan polls, animated GIFs, and VR. And these features enable viewers to come together and to build communities around their favorite content. So one of my favorite stories of a YouTube community is the Enable Network. A few years ago, an engineering professor named John Scholl saw a YouTube video about a carpenter who had lost two of his fingers. The carpenter worked with a colleague for over a year to build an affordable 3D printed prosthesis that would enable him to go back to work. They then applied this technology for a young boy who was born without any fingers. So inspired by this video, the professor posted a single comment on the video asking for volunteers with 3D printers to help print affordable prosthesis. The network has since grown into a community of over 6,000 people who have designed, printed, and distributed these prosthetics to children in over 50 countries. So today, thousands of children have regained the ability to walk, touch, play, and all because of the one video one comment, and that incredible YouTube community that formed to help. And that's just one example of the many passionate communities that are coming together on YouTube around video. So the third feature of this new medium is that video works on demand on any screen. Over 60% of our watch time now comes from mobile devices. But actually, our fastest growing screen isn't the one in your pocket. It's the one in your living room. Our watch time in our living room is growing at over 90% a year. So let's now welcome Sara Ali, Head of Living Room Products, to the stage to talk about the latest features in the living room. about how people are watching YouTube on the TV via the Assistant. But another way people are enjoying video is through the YouTube app, which is available on over half a billion smart TVs, game consoles, and streaming devices. And that number continues to grow around the world. So when I think about why YouTube is so compelling in the living room, it isn't just about the size of the screen, it's about giving you an experience that TV just can't match. First, YouTube offers you the largest library of on-demand content. Second, 
Our recommendations build channels and lineups based on your personal interests and what you enjoy watching. And third, it's a two-way interactive experience with features like voice control. And today, I'm super excited to announce that we are taking the interactive experience a step further by introducing 360 video in the YouTube app on the big screen. And you know that you can already watch 360 videos on your phone or in your daydream headset, but soon you'll be able to feel like you're in the middle of the action, right from your couch and on the biggest screen you own. One of my personal interests outside of work is to travel. And one place I'd love to visit is Alaska to check out the Northern Lights. So let's do a voice search, Aurora Borealis 360. Great, let's choose that first video. And now, using my TV remote, I'm able to pan around this video, checking out this awesome view from every single angle. Traveling is great, especially when I don't have to get on a flight, but 360 is now a brand new way to attend concerts. I didn't make it to Coachella, but here I can experience it like I was on stage. And to enhance the experience even further, we are also introducing live 360 in the living room. Soon, you'll be able to witness moments and events as they unfold in a new, truly immersive way. So whether you have a Sony Android TV or an Xbox One console, soon you'll be able to explore 360 videos right from the comfort of your couch and along with your friends and family. And now to help show you another way we're enabling interactivity, please join me in welcoming Barbara McDonald, who's the lead of something we call Super Chat. everybody on the live stream, as Susan mentioned. What makes YouTube special is the relationships that creators are able to foster with their fans. And one of the best ways to connect with your fans is to bring them live, behind the scenes of your videos, offering up can't miss content. In the past year, the number of creators live streaming on YouTube has grown by 4x. This growth is awesome, and we want to do even more to deepen the connection between creators and their fans during live streams. That's why earlier this year, we rolled out a new feature called Super Chat. When a creator is live streaming, fans can purchase Super Chats, which are highlighted fun chat messages. Not only do fans love the recognition, but creators earn extra money from it. In the past three months since launch, we've been amazed by the different ways creators are using Super Chat. Even April, our favorite pregnant giraffe, who unfortunately could not be here with us today, has raised tens of thousands of dollars for her home, the Animal Adventure Park. Okay, okay, we can clap for that. <laughs> But enough talking for me. We are going to do a live stream right here, right now, to show all of you how Super Chat works. And to help me, I am very excited to introduce top YouTube creators with nine million subscribers and over one billion lifetime channel views on the grass back there, the slow-mo guys. Great to have you. So let's pull up their live stream. And just look, chat is flying. Now, I love the slow-mo guys, and I want to make sure that they see my message. So I'm going to super chat them. Pulled up the stream, and right from within live chat, I'm able to enter my message, select my amount, make the purchase, and send. Boom! See how much that message stands out? <laughs> and it gets pinned to the top. Cool, right? 
Yeah, thanks Barbara. It's actually uh, lovely at the minute, although I feel like there's a high chance of showers. Very local showers, like specifically to this stage. Very sudden, yeah. I wonder, I wonder. Well, because we know developers are incredibly creative, we wanted to see what you can do to make Super Chat even more interactive. So we've launched an API for it. And today, we're taking it to the next level with a new developer integration that triggers actions in the real world. This means that when a fan sends a super chat to a creator, things can happen in real life, such as turning the lights on or off in the creator's studio, flying a drone around, or pushing buttons on their toys and gadgets. The Slomo guys are going to create their next slow motion video using Super Chat's API. We have now rigged things up so that when I send my next Super Chat, it will automatically trigger the lights and a big horn in this amphitheater, okay? And that is going to signal our friends back there on the lawn to unleash a truckload of water balloons at the slow-mo guys. I'm scared. Yeah. <laughs> That's right, but every dollar we're going to take another balloon, so more money means more balloons. Although I did hear a guy over here go, oh, we're going to totally nail these guys. All right. That's got to be <laughs> at least four dollars right there. So yeah, each dollar donated goes to the cause that Susan mentioned earlier, the e -Naval Network. Okay, so how much do you think we can send? I can start at a dollar and go anywhere upwards from there, so it's for charity. How do we think uh, 100? How's that sound? Okay, higher, higher, 200, 200? How about $500 for 500 balloons? $500! I can do that, I can do that. Okay. So I'm gonna send my super chat and hit send. 500! Woo! <laughs> that was amazing! Thank you everybody for your help! So this obviously just scratches the surface of what is possible using Super Chat's open APIs. And we are super excited to see what all of you will do with it next. So Susan, how about you come back out here and let's check out the video we've all made. from today, 100x, to make sure that we're supplying prosthetics to children in need around the world. So that 360 living room demo and the Super Chat demo, those are just two examples of how we are working to connect people around the globe together with video. Now, I hope that what you've seen today is that the future of media is a future of openness and diversity, a future filled with conversations and community, and a future that works across all screens. Together with creators, viewers, and partners, we are building the platform of that future. Thank you, IO, and please, Welcome me and, join, and, and uh, Dave Burke joining us to talk about Android.
everybody. It's great to be here at Google I.O. 2017. As you can see, we found some new ways to hardware accelerate Android, this time with Jetpacks. Uh, but seriously, 2 billion active devices is incredible. And that's just smartphones and tablets. We're also seeing new momentum in areas such as TVs and cars and watches and laptops and beyond. So let me take a moment and give you a quick update on how Android is doing in those areas. Android Wear 2.0 launched earlier this year with a new update for Android and iPhone users. And with new partners like Emporio Armani, Movado, and New Balance, we now enable 24 of the world's top watch brands. Android Auto, we've seen a 10x user growth since last year, it's supported by more than 300 car models and the Android Auto mobile app. And just this week, Audi and Volvo announced that their next generation NAV systems will be powered by Android for a more seamless connected car experience. Android TV, we've partnered with over 100 cable operators and hardware manufacturers around the world. And now we're now seeing 1 million device activations every two months. And there are more than 3,000 Android TV apps in the Play Store. This year, we're releasing a brand new launcher interface and bringing the Google Assistant to Android TV. Android Things previewed late last year, and already there are thousands of developers in over 60 countries using it to build connected devices with easy access to the Google Assistant, TensorFlow, and more. The full launch is coming later this year. Chromebooks comprise almost 60% of K-12 laptops sold in the US, and the momentum is growing globally. And now, with the added ability to run Android apps, you get to target laptops too. Now, of course, platforms are only as good as the apps they run. The Google Play ecosystem is more vibrant than ever. Android users installed a staggering 82 billion apps and games in the past year. That's 11 apps for every person on the planet. All right, so let's come back to smartphones. And the real reason I'm here is to talk about Android O. Two months ago, we launched our very first developer preview, so you could kick the tires on some of the new APIs. And of course, it's very much a work in progress, but you can expect the release later this summer. Today, we want to walk you through two themes in O that we're excited about. The first is something we call fluid experiences. It's pretty incredible what you can do in a mobile phone today and how much we rely on them as computers in our pockets. But there are still certain things that are tough to do in a small screen. So we're doing a couple of features in O that we think will help with this, which I'll cover in just a moment. The second theme is something we call vitals. And the concept here is to keep vital system behavior in a healthy state so we can maximize the user's battery, performance, and reliability. So let's jump straight in and walk through four new fluid experiences with live demos done wirelessly. What could possibly go wrong? All right. Uh, these days, we do a lot at once on our phones, whether it's paying for groceries while reading a text message you just received or looking up guitar chords while listening to a new song. But conventional multi-window techniques don't translate well to mobile. They're just too fiddly to set up when you're on the go. We think picture in picture is the answer for many cases. So let's take a look. My kids recently asked me to build a lemonade stand. So I opened up YouTube, and I started researching DIY videos, and I found this one. Now, at the same time, I want to be able to jot down the materials I need to build for this lemonade stand. So to multitask, all I do is press the home button, and boom, I get picture in picture. You can think of it as a kind of automatic multi-window. I can move it out of the way, I can launch keep, I can add some more materials, so I know I need to get some uh, wood glue, like so. Then when I'm done, I just simply swipe it away like that. It's brilliant. Picture-in-picture <laughs> -picture lets you do more with your phone. It works great when video calling with Duo. For example, maybe I need to check my calendar while planning a barbecue with friends. And there are lots of other great use cases. For example, picture-in-picture -picture for maps navigation or watching Netflix in the background and a lot more. And we're also excited to see what you come up with for this feature. We're also making notification interactions more fluid for users. From the beginning, Android has really blazed a trail when it comes to its advanced notification system. In O, 
we're extending the reach of notifications with something we call notification dots. It's a new way for app developers to indicate that there's activity in their app and to drive engagement. So let's take a look. You'll notice that the Instagram app icon has a dot in it. And this is indicating that there's a notification associated with the app. So if I pull down the shade, sure enough, you can see there's a notification. In this case, someone's commented on a photo I'm tagged in. What's really cool is I can long press the app icon, and we now show the notification in place. One of the things I really like about the notification dot mechanism is that it works with zero effort from the app developer. We even extract the color of the dot from your icon. Oh, and you get to erase the icon by simply swiping the notification like that, so you're always in control. Another great feature in O that helps make your experience more fluid is autofill. Now, if you use Chrome, you're probably already familiar with autofill for quickly filling out a username and password or credit card information with a single tap. With O, we've extended autofill to apps. Let's say I'm setting up a new phone for the first time, and I open Twitter, and I want to log in. Now, because I use Twitter.com all the time on Chrome, this system will automatically suggest my username. I can simply tap it, I get my password, and then, boom, I'm logged in. It's pretty awesome. Autofill takes the pain out of setting up a new phone or tablet. Once the user opts in, Autofill will work for most applications. We also provide APIs for developers to customize Autofill for their experience. I want to show you one more demo of how we're making Android more fluid by improving copy and paste. The feature is called Smart Text Selection. So let's take a look. In Android, you typically long press or double tap a word to select it. For example, I can open Gmail, I can start composing, and if I double tap the word byte, it gets selected like so. Now, we know from user studies that phone numbers are the most copy and pasted items. The second most common are named entities like businesses and people and places. In O, we're applying on-device machine learning in this case, a fee for neural network to recognize these more complicated entities. So watch this. I can double tap anywhere on the phrase old coffee house, and all of it is selected for me. No more fiddling around with tech selection handles. It even works uh, for addresses. So if I double tap on the address, all of it is selected. And what's more, there is more. What's more is the machine learning model classifies this as an address and automatically suggests maps so I can get directions to it with a single click. And of course, it works as you expect for phone numbers. You get the phone dialer suggested. And for email addresses, you get Gmail uh, suggested. All of this neural networking processing happens on device in real time and without any data leaving the device. It's pretty awesome. Now, on-device machine learning helps make your phone smarter. And we want to help you build experiences like what you just saw. So we're doing two things to help. First, I'm excited to announce that we're creating a specialized version of TensorFlow, Google's open source machine learning library, which we call TensorFlow Lite. It's a library for apps designed to be fast and small, yet still enabling state-of-the-art techniques like ConvNets and LSTMs. Second, we're introducing a new framework in Android to hardware accelerate neural computation. TensorFlow Lite will leverage a new neural network API to tap into silicon-specific accelerators. And over time, we expect to see DSPs specifically designed for neural network inference and training. We think these new capabilities will help power a next generation of on-device speech processing, visual search, augmented reality, and more. TensorFlow Lite will soon be part of the open source TensorFlow project, and the neural network API will be made available later in an update to O this year. OK, so that's a quick tour of some of the fluid experiences in O. Let's switch gears and talk about Vitals. So to tell you more, I want to hand over to Steph, who's been instrumental in driving this project. Thank you. Hi, everyone. OK, so all the features Dave talked about are cool. But we think your phone's foundations are even more important. Battery life, security, startup time, and stability. After all, if your battery dies at 4 PM, none of the other features that Dave talked about really matter. So in O, 
we're investing in what we call vitals, keeping your phone secure and in a healthy state to maximize power and performance. We've invested in three foundational building blocks, security enhancements, OS optimizations, and tools to help developers build great apps. First, security. Android was built with security in mind from day one with application sandboxing. As Android has matured, we've developed vast mobile security services. Now, we use machine learning to continuously comb apps uploaded to play, flagging potentially harmful apps. Then, we scan over 50 billion apps every day, scanning every installed app on every connected device. And when we find a potentially harmful app, we disable it or remove it. Now, we found most Android users don't know these services come built in with Android devices with Play. So for greater peace of mind, we're making them more visible and accessible and doubling down on our commitment to security with the introduction of Google Play Protect. So here you can see Play Protect has recently scanned all your apps, no problems found. That's Google Play Protect. It's available out of the box on every Android device with Google Play. Second, OS optimizations. The single biggest visible change in O is boot time. On Pixel, for example, you'll find in most cases your boot time is now twice as fast. And we've made all apps faster by default. We did this through extensive changes to our runtime. Now, this is really cool stuff, like concurrent compacting garbage collection and code locality. But all you really need to know is that your apps will run faster and smoother. Take Google Sheets. Aggregate performance over a bunch of common actions is now over two times as fast. And that's all from the OS. There are no changes to the app. But we found apps could still have a huge impact on performance. Some apps were running in the background, and they were consuming tons of system resources, especially draining battery. So in O, we're adding wise limits to background location and background execution. These boundaries put sensible limits on usage. They're protecting battery life and freeing up memory. Now, our third theme is helping developers build great apps. And here, I want to speak directly to all the developers in the audience. Wouldn't it be cool if Android's engineering team could show you what causes performance issues? Today, we've launched Play Console dashboards that analyze every app and pinpoint six top issues that cause battery drain, crashes, and slow UI. For each issue the app has, we show how many users are affected and provide guidance on the best way to fix. Now, imagine if developers could also have a powerful profiler to visualize what's happening inside the app. In Android Studio, we've also launched new unified profiling tools for network, memory, and CPU. So developers can now see everything on a unified timeline and then dive into each profiler. For example, on CPU, you can see every thread. You can look at the call stack and the time every call is taking. You can visualize where the CPU is going, and you can jump to the exact line of code. OK, so that's Android Vitals. How are investing in your phone's foundational security and performance? Later today, you'll see Android's developer story from end to end. Our hard work to help developers build great apps at every stage, writing code, tuning, launching, and growing. But there is one more thing. One thing we think would be an incredible compliment to the story. And it is one thing our team has never done for developers. We have never added a new programming language to Android. And today, we're making Kotlin an officially supported language in Android. <laughs> developer community has already asked for. It makes developers so much more productive. It is fully Android runtime compatible. It is totally interoperable with your existing code. It has fabulous IDE support. And it's mature and production ready from day one. We are also announcing our plans to partner with JetBrains, creating a foundation for Kotlin. I am so happy uh, JetBrains CEO, Max Shafarov, is here today. This new language is wonderful. 
but we also thought we should increase our investment in our existing languages. So we're doing that too. Please join us at the developer keynote later today to hear our story from end to end. OK, so let's wrap up. There are tons more features in Android O, which we don't have time to go into today. Everything from redesigned settings to Project Treble, which is one of the biggest changes to the foundations of Android to date, to downloadable fonts with new emoji, and much more. If you want to try some of these features for yourself, and you do, I'm happy to announce we're making the first beta release of O available today. Head over to android.com slash beta. But there's more. <laughs> you probably thought we were done talking about Android O, but I'd like you to hear some more about Android. And from that, please welcome Samir. Thank you. Thanks, Steph. Hi, everyone. From the beginning, Android's mission has been to bring the power of computing to everyone. And we've seen tremendous growth over the last few years, from the high-end to entry-level devices in countries like Indonesia, Brazil, and India. In fact, there are now more users of Android in India than there are in the US. And every minute, seven Brazilians come online for the first time. Now, all this progress is amazing. For those of us who have a smartphone, we intuitively understand the profound impact that computing is having on our daily lives. And that's why our team gets so excited about how we can help bring this technology to everyone. So we took a step back to think about what it would take to get smartphones to more people. There are a few things that are clear. Devices would need to be more affordable, with entry-level prices dropping significantly. This means hardware that uses less power pack processors and far less memory than on premium devices. But the hardware is only half the equation. The software also has to be tuned for users' needs around limited data connectivity and multilingual use. We learned a lot from our past efforts here with Project Svelte and KitKat and the original Android One program. But we felt like the time was right to take our investment to the next level. So today, I'm excited to give you a sneak peek into a new experience we're building for entry-level Android devices. Internally, we call it Android Go. Android Go focuses on three things. First, optimizing the latest release of Android to run smoothly on entry-level devices, starting with Android O. Second, a rebuilt set of Google apps that use less memory, storage space, and mobile data. And third, a version of the Play Store that contains the whole app catalog, but highlights the apps designed by all of you for the next billion users. And all three of these things will ship together as a single experience, starting on Android O devices with one gigabyte or less of memory. Let's take a look at some of the things we're working on for Android Go. First, let's talk about the operating system. For manufacturers to make more affordable entry-level devices, the prices of their components have to come down. Let's take one example. Memory is an expensive component. So we're making a number of optimizations to the system UI and the kernel to allow an Android O device built with the Go configuration to run smoothly with as little as 512 megabytes to one gigabyte of memory. Now, on-device performance is critical, but data costs and intermittent connectivity are also big challenges for users. One person put it best to me when she said, mobile data feels like currency, and she wanted more control over the way she spent it. So on these devices, we're putting data management front and center in quick settings. And we've created an API that carriers can integrate with, so you can see exactly how much prepaid data you have left, and even top up right there on the device. But beyond the OS, the Google apps are also getting smarter about data. For example, on these devices, the Chrome Data Saver feature will be turned on by default. Data Saver transcodes content on the server and simplifies pages when you're on a slow connection. Now, now we're making the savings more visible here in the UI. In aggregate, this feature is saving users over 750 terabytes of data every day. I'm really excited that the YouTube team has designed a new app called YouTube Go for their users with limited data connectivity. 
feedback from the, on the new YouTube app has been phenomenal. And we're taking many of the lessons we've learned here and applying them to several of our Google apps. Let me show you some of the things I love about YouTube Go. First, there's a new preview experience, so you can get a sneak peek inside a video before you decide to spend your data to watch it. And when you're sure this is the video for you, you can select the streaming quality you want and see exactly how much mobile data that's gonna cost you. But my favorite feature of YouTube Go is the ability to save videos while you're connected so you can watch them later when you might not have access to data. And if you wanna share any of those videos with a friend, you can use the built-in peer-to-peer sharing feature to connect two of your devices together directly and share the files across without using any of your mobile data at all. Beyond data management, the Google Apps will also make it easier to seamlessly go between multiple languages, which is a really common use case for people coming online today. For example, Gboard now supports over 191 languages, including the recent addition of 22 Indian languages. And there's even a transliteration feature, which allows you to spell words phonetically on a QWERTY keyboard to type in your native language script. A Gboard is super cool, so I want to show it to you. I grew up in the US, so for any of my family that's watching, don't get too excited by the demo. I haven't learned Hindi yet, and I'm sorry, Mom. Okay. So let's say I want to send a quick note to my aunt in India. I can open up Allo, and using Gboard, I can type how it sounds phonetically, Dum Keseho, which means, how are you, in Hindi. And transliteration automatically gives me Hindi script. That's pretty cool. Now let's say I want to ask her how my IO speech is going, but I don't know how to say that in Hindi at all. I can use the built-in Google Translate feature to say, how is this going? And seamlessly, I get Hindi script, all built right into the keyboard. My, my family is apparently a tough audience. All right. <laughs> well, the Google apps are getting Goified, what has always propelled Android forward is the apps from all of you. And no surprise, many of our developer partners have optimized their apps already. So to better connect users with these experiences, we'll be highlighting them in the Play Store. One example is right here on Play's homepage. To be eligible for these new sections, we've published a set of best practices called Building for Billions, which includes recommendations we've seen make a big difference in the consumer experience. Things such as designing a useful offline state, reducing your APK size to less than 10 megabytes, and using GCM or Job Scheduler for better battery and memory performance. And also in Building for Billions, you'll find best practices for optimizing your web experience. We've seen developers build amazing things with new technology, such as progressive web apps. We hope you can come to our developer keynote later today to learn a whole lot more. Okay, that was a quick walkthrough of some of the things coming in Android Go. Starting with Android O, all devices with one gigabyte of RAM or less will get the Go configuration. And going forward, every Android release will have a Go configuration. We'll be unveiling much more later this year with the first devices shipping in 2018. We look forward to seeing what you'll build and how we can bring computing to the next several billion users. Next up, next up you'll be hearing from Clay on one of Google's newest platforms that we're really excited about, VR and AR. Thank you. Thank you, Samir. Uh, so Sundar talked about how technologies like machine learning and conversational interfaces make computing more intuitive by enabling our computers to work more like we do. And we see VR and AR in the same light. They enable us to experience computing just as we experience the real world. Virtual reality can be transporting. You can experience not just what it's like to see someplace, but what it's like to really be there. And augmented reality uses your surroundings as context and puts computing into the real world. A lot has happened since Google I.O. last year, and I'm excited to share a bit of what we've been up to. So let's start with VR. Last year, we announced Daydream, our platform for mobile virtual reality. And then in October, to kickstart the Daydream ecosystem, we released Daydream View, a VR headset made by Google. It's super comfortable, it's really easy to use, and there's tons to do with it. 
You can play inside alternate worlds in games like virtual virtual reality. You can see any part of our world with apps like Street View, and you can visit other worlds with apps like Hello Mars. There's already a great selection of Daydream phones out there, and we're working with partners to get Daydream on even more. First, I'm pleased that LG's next flagship phone, which launches later this year, will support Daydream. And there's another. I'm excited to announce that the Samsung Galaxy S8 and S8 Plus will add Daydream support this summer with a software update. So Samsung, of course, they make many of the most popular phones in the world, and we're delighted to have them supporting Daydream. So great momentum in Daydream's first six months. Let's talk about what's next. So with Daydream, we showed that you can create high-quality mobile VR experiences with just a smartphone and a simple headset. And there are a lot of nice things about smartphone VR. It's easy. There aren't a bunch of cables and things to fuss with. You can choose from a bunch of great compatible phones. And of course, it's portable. You can throw your headset in a bag. We asked, how can we take the best parts of smartphone VR and create a kind of device with an even better experience? Well, I'm excited to announce that an entirely new kind of VR device is coming to Daydream, what we call standalone VR headsets. And we're working with partners to make them. So what's a standalone headset? Well, the idea is that you have everything you need for VR built right into the headset itself. There's no cables, no phone, and certainly no big PC. And the whole device is designed just for VR. And that's cool for a couple of reasons. First, it's easy to use. Getting into VR is as easy as picking the thing up. And it's one step in two seconds. And second, presence. And by that, I mean really feeling like you're there. By building every part of the device specifically for VR, we've been able to optimize everything. The displays, the optics, the sensors, all to deliver a stronger sense of being transported. And nothing heightens the feeling of presence like precise tracking, how the headset tracks your movement. And we've dramatically improved tracking with a technology that we call WorldSense. So WorldSense enables what's known as positional tracking. With it, your view in the virtual world exactly matches your movement in the real world. And it works by using a handful of sensors on the device that look out into your surroundings. And that means it works anywhere. There's no setup, there's no cameras to install, and with it, you really feel like you're there. Now, just as we did with Daydream Ready smartphones, we're taking a platform approach with standalone headsets, working with partners to build some great devices. To start, we worked with Qualcomm to create a Daydream standalone headset reference design, a sort of device blueprint that partners can build from. And we're working closely with two amazing consumer electronics companies to build the first headsets. First, HTC, the company that created the Vive. We're excited about it too. They're a leader in VR, and we're delighted to be working with them on a standalone VR headset for Daydream. And second, Lenovo. We've been partners for years working together on Tango, and now we're excited to work with them on VR. These devices will start to come to market later this year. So that's the update on VR. Great momentum with apps, more daydream-ready phones on the way, and a new category of devices that we think people are going to love. So let's turn to augmented reality. Now, a lot of us were introduced to the idea of AR last year with Pokemon Go. The app gave us a glimpse of AR, and it showed us us just how cool it can be to have digital objects show up in our world. Well, we've been working in this space since 2013 with Tango, a sensing technology that enables devices to understand space more like we do. Two years ago, in 2015, we released a developer kit. Then last year, we shipped the first consumer-ready Tango phone. And I'm excited to announce that the second generation Tango phone, the Asus Zenfone AR, will go on sale this summer. Now, looking at the slides, you may notice a trend. The devices are getting smaller, and you can imagine far more devices having this capability in the future. It's been awesome to see what developers have done with the technology. And one thing we've seen clearly is that AR is most powerful when it's tightly coupled to the real world, and the more precisely, the better. That's why we've been working with the Google Maps team on a service that can give devices access to very precise location information indoors. It's kind of like GPS, but instead of talking to satellites to figure out where it is, your phone looks for distinct visual features in the environment, and it triangulates with those. So you have GPS. We call this VPS, Google's Visual Positioning Service. 
And we think it's gonna be incredibly useful in a whole bunch of places. For example, imagine you're at Lowe's, a home improvement store that has basically everything. And if you've been there, you know it's really big. And we've all had that moment when you're struggling to find that one weird random screwdriver thing. Well, imagine in the future, your phone could just take you to that exact screwdriver and point it out to you on the shelf. It turns out we can do this with VPS. And let me show you how. And this is working today. So here we are walking down an aisle at Lowe's, and the phone will find these key visual feature points, which you can see there in yellow. And by comparing the feature points against previously observed ones, those colorful dots in the back, the phone can figure out exactly where it is in space down to within a few centimeters. So GPS can get you to the door, and then VPS can get you to the exact item that you're looking for. Further out, Further out, imagine what this technology could mean to people with impaired vision, for example. VPS and an audio-based interface could transform how they make their way through the world. And it combines so many things that Google is good at. Mapping, computer vision, distributed computing. And we think precise location will be critical for camera-based interfaces. So VPS will be one of the core capabilities of Google Lens. We're really excited about the possibilities here. So last thing I wanted to share is something that we've been working on that brings many of these capabilities together in a really important area, and that's education. Two years ago, we launched Expeditions, which is a tool for teachers to take their classes on virtual reality field trips, and two million students have used it. Today, we're excited to announce that we're adding a new capability to Expeditions, AR mode, which enables kind of the ultimate show and tell right in the classroom. If we could roll the video, please. Right, want to see a volcano? Three, two, one. Wow! Look at that lava, look at that smoke coming out of that. Pretend you're an airplane and fly over the, the tornado. That's the top of it. What do you see? It's either asteroid, meteorite. We're learning about DNA and genes, things that we can't see. And so the most exciting thing for me with the AR technology was that I could see kids get an aha moment that I couldn't get by just telling them about it. The minute I saw it pop up on the screen, it made me want to get up and walk to it. We actually get to turn around and look at things from all angles, so it gave us a nice perspective. See if you can figure out what that might be based on what you know about the respiratory system. I got to see where the alveoli branched off and I could look inside them and see how everything worked, which I never saw before, and it was really, really cool. Just delighted with the response we're seeing so far, and we'll be rolling this out later in the year. So, VR and AR, two different flavors of what you might call immersive computing. Computing that works more like we do. We think that's a big idea. And in time, we see VR and AR changing how we work and play, live and learn. And all that I talked about here, these are just the first steps. But we can see where all of this goes, and we're incredibly excited about what's ahead. Thanks so much. Back to Sundar. We wanted to make machine learning an open source project so that everyone outside of Google could use the same system we're using inside. source platform when you see what people can do on top of it. Uh, we're really excited about the momentum behind TensorFlow. It's already the most popular ML repository on GitHub, and we're going to push it further. Uh, we're also announcing the TensorFlow Research Cloud. We are giving away 1,000 cloud TPUs, which is 180 petaflops of computing, to academics and researchers for free so that they can do more stuff with it.
I'm always amazed by the stories I hear from developers when I meet them. I want to highlight one young developer today, Abu Qadir from Chicago. He's used TensorFlow to help improve health for everyone. Let's take a look. My name is Abu. I am a high school student, 17 years old. My freshman year, I remember Googling machine learning. I had no clue what it meant. That's a really cool thing about the internet is that someone's already doing it, so you can just YouTube it and it's right there. The minute I really saw what machine learning can do, it kind of like hit something within me. This like need to build things to help people. My parents are immigrants from Afghanistan. It's not easy coming in. The only reason we made it through some of the times that we did was because people showed acts of kindness. Seeing that at an early age was enough for me to understand that helping people always comes back to you. And then it kind of hit me in a way where I could actually genuinely help people. Mammograms are the cheapest imaging format there is. It's the most accessible to people all around the world. But one of the biggest problems that we see in breast cancer is misdiagnosis. So I decided I was going to build a system for early detection of breast cancer tumors that's accessible to everyone and that's more accurate. How is I going to do it? Machine learning. The biggest, most extensive resource that I've used is this platform called TensorFlow. I've spent so many hours going really deep into these open source libraries and just figuring out how it works. Eventually, I wrote a whole system that can help radiologists make their decisions. I'm by no means a wizard at machine learning. I'm completely self-taught. I'm in high school. I YouTubed and just found my way through it. You don't know about that kid in Brazil that might have a groundbreaking idea or that kid in Somalia. You don't know that they have these ideas, but if you can open source your tools, you can give them a little bit of hope that they can actually conquer what they're thinking of. Abu started this as a school project and he's continued to build it on his own. We are very, very fortunate to have Abu and his family here with us today. Thank you for joining us. Enjoy IO. We've been talking about machine learning in terms of how it'll power new experiences in research. But it's also important we think about how this technology can have an immediate impact on people's lives by creating opportunities for economic empowerment. 46% of US employers say they face talent shortages and have issues filling open job positions, while job seekers may be looking for openings right next door. There is a big disconnect here. Just like we focused our contributions to teachers and students, through Google for Education, we want to better connect employers and job seekers it's through a new initiative, Google for Jobs. Google for Jobs is our commitment to use our products to help people find work. It's a complex, multifaceted problem, but we've been investing a lot over the past year, and we've made significant progress. Last November, we announced a Cloud Jobs API. Think of it as a first fully end-to-end -end pre trained vertical machine learning model through Google Cloud, which we give to employers. FedEx, Johnson & Johnson, Helsa, Carrier Builder, and we are expanding to many more employers. So in Johnson & Johnson's carrier side, they found that applicants were 18% more likely to apply to a job, suggesting the matching is working more efficiently. And so far, or over four and a half million people have interacted with this API. But as we started working on this, we realized the first step for many people when they start looking for a job is searching on Google. So it's like other search challenges we have worked in the past. So we built a new feature in search with the goal that no matter who you are or what kind of job you're looking for, you can find the job postings that are right for you. And as part of this effort, we work hard to include jobs across experience and wage levels, including jobs that have traditionally been much harder to search and classify. Think retail jobs, hospitality jobs, etc. 
To do this well, we have worked with many partners, LinkedIn, Monster, Facebook, Carry Builder, Glassdoor, and many more. So let's take a look at how it works. Let's say you come to Google and you start searching for retail jobs and you're from Pittsburgh. We understand that. You can scroll down and click into this immersive experience and we immediately start showing the most relevant jobs for you. And you can filter, you can choose full time, and as you can see, you can drill down easily. I want to look at jobs which are posted in the past three days. So you can do that. Now you're looking at retail jobs in Pittsburgh posted within the last three days. You can also filter by job titles. It turns out employees and employers use many different terminologies. For example, retail could mean a store clerk, a sales representative, store manager. We use machine learning to cluster automatically and so that we can bring all the relevant jobs for you. As you scroll through it, you will notice that we even show commute times. It turns out to be an important criteria for many people, and we'll soon add a filter for that as well. And if you find something that's of interest to you, so maybe the retail position in draws, and you, know, you can click on it, and you end up going to it right away, and you're one click away. You can scroll through, find more information if you want, and you're one click away from clicking and applying there. It's a powerful tool. We are addressing jobs of every skill level and experience level, and we are committed to making these tools work for everyone. As part of building it, we literally talk to hundreds of people. So whether you are in a community college looking for a barista job, a teacher who's relocating across the country and you want teaching jobs, or someone who's looking for work in construction, the product should do a great job of bringing that information to you. We are rolling this out in the U.S. in the coming weeks, and then we are going to expand it to more countries in the future. I'm personally enthusiastic for this initiative because it addresses an important need and taps our core capabilities as a company, from searching and organizing information to AI and machine learning. It's been a busy morning. You know, we've talked about this important shift from a mobile first to an AI first world and we are driving it forward across all our products and platforms so that all of you can build powerful experiences for new users everywhere. It'll take all of us working together to bring the benefits of technology to everyone. I believe we are on the verge of solving some of the most important problems we face. That's our hope, let's do it together. Thanks for your time today and enjoy Google I.O.